Great, okay, well, we're one minute in, so let me hand over to Scott Story from Open Center, who will introduce this webinar for us. Thank you, Scott. Hi, good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining me for today's event. I'm Scott Story, Head of UK Operations at Open Center, and my role today is to facilitate our webinar, The Climate Emergency, Reducing the Carbon Footprint of Bereavement Services, Part 2. Um, We've got around 45 minutes of information to share with you today, after which we'll have some additional time to take questions. As we go through today, please do add any questions that come to mind in the Q&A section, which you can access from the button towards the bottom of your screen. You can also chat with us and your fellow attendees via the chat button or window. I have some colleagues online with me today as well who will be monitoring that chat area. So if you have any issues at all, please let us know in the chat as well, and we can try and assist. Finally, as is the case with all of our webinars, today's event is being recorded and we'll make that recording available to everyone who registered or attended uh, over the next few days. So in our last webinar, we started to hear from some of the service providers and partners identifying aspects of best practice today that will help uh, exploring alternative technologies, as well as working to create benchmarks and activities and agreed standard definitions. Today, we'll hear from three more suppliers and service providers. Our panel for today's webinar includes Simon Holder, uh, founder and CEO of the Farmers Group. Simon's passion is rooted in the scientific and fact-based development of sustainable and environmentally positive practices and alternatives for the industry. The group at present has two companies operating within the funeral sector, the Woodland Burial Company and Natural Transitions. The Faunus Group are currently finishing the development of the next generation in body dispersal technology, offering for the first time a viable alternative to the current options of cremation and burial. Uh, also joining us is Dennis Jacobs. Uh, since 2016, Dennis has been a member of the DFW Europe Sales and Customer Advisor team. He has over 25 years of experience in different fields as a planner, project manager, purchase manager and account manager. Dennis believes that in our profession, suppliers build up a relationship with the customer and you went in, into that relationship for a minimum of 20 years, the lifespan of the DFW cremators. Dennis believes that his key roles are helping his customers advising them and doing as you promise in order to ensure the relationship stays strong. Technical difficulties. We're also joined by Hannah, Hannah Leverton. Hannah manages the communications for Leverton and Sons and supports her sister, Pippa and cousin Andrew, both directors of the family firm. Family members of SAFE, Levitons is an independent family run firm since 1789 and is based in North London. Although Hannah grew up popping into the office and helping her family with filing from a young age, she didn't really formally join the firm until 2010. After university, she worked in marketing and events, leading her to set up her own business, which still operates to this day. Since then, it became apparent she could help with the communication side of the business. And having that understanding of the ethos and legacy of Lev Levitons meant she could support the firm, especially in the digital marketing movement that was taking place. Levitons has been a pioneering funeral director for some time, especially in the provision of eco-friendly funerals, and was one of worlds for its initiatives, including creating the UK's first all-electric hearse. She is proud to work alongside such a dedicated and honourable group of people who genuinely care about the people they look after and the environmental sustainability of the profession. And finally today, uh, Brendan Day. Brendan is Secretary and Executive Officer of the Federation of Burial and Cremation Authorities. And Brendan will be joining the panel for the Q&A section later in the webinar. So, um, the key ingredient highlighted as part of our second webinar by John Cross is that technological change in isolation will not deliver the UK net zero targets. For bereavement services, this adds to the complexity with the remaining 59% of impact inextricably linked to societal and behavioural change. It's not just using green energy, it's helping clients to make an informed choice. 
And with the UK government recently announcing that they've brought forward the targets by 15 years from 2050 to 2035, we collectively have a lot to do to ensure compliance and very little time to do it. We all have a part to play to review the services that each of us provide and what can be done to minimise the environmental impact of our services. And our panel today will provide insights from three very different aspects. There is no singular answer. Our first panellist is Dennis Jacobs, who's going to provide some insights as to how DFW are approaching the environment question. Over to you, Dennis. All right. Good morning to you all. Welcome. I'm going to tell something about the facts and figures of our electric cremator, DFW Electric. So next slide, please, Scott. All right. These are our key points of the DFW Electric. We have no emission from the gas burners, no use of fossil fuel at 100% green energy, a 50% CO2 reduction compared to gas or oil heated cremators, a 50% NOx reduction compared to gas or oil heated cremators, and long lasting heat resistant brickwork. We have cost savings in maintenance. We have a very low energy consumption. Extraction heat energy uses of the cremation process is still possible. And energy which is necessary for the cremation process comes from the coffin in the body. The emissions of the DFW electric meet the PG5 emission demands. And every cremation gives energy, so no need to gather them for the next day. And it's ultra silent and I will go to each and every point in this presentation. Next slide, please. No emission from the gas burners. So that means no moisture from the combustion of gas. If you have, say, 32 cubic meters of gas, then you also get 32 liters of water to your system. We don't have that anymore. Due to that lack of gas burners, we also have a lower flue gas volume. And of course, no NOx and COT emission from the combustion of natural gas. And due to the lack of the, the powerful burners, it's also ultra silent. Next slide, please. Now, of course, if you have no use of fossil fuel in 100% green energy, then you have no CO2 emission from the cremator itself. But in the next sheet, we work with the figures of the UK-based electricity generation emissions data because we, we extract the power from the grid and it is a mixture of all kinds of energy sources. Next slide, please. When we start with the electric cremator, this was our key point, 50% CO2 reduction. But our philosophy was, that 50% of the cremation process comes from the body and the coffin. And that is the first bullet, the CO2 production of 102 kilogram cremation process, say a person of 75 kilogram plus the coffin, then you get about 113 kilograms of CO2. But in the next slides, we leave that out and we only compare the electric cremator with the gas cremator. And if you have the combustion of one cubic meter natural gas, you produce about 1.8 kilograms CO2. And from that base electricity generation emissions data, you have the numbers of, if you have one kilowatt of electricity, then you create about 0 0.25 kilograms CO2. When you count with an average gas consumption of 32 cubic meters natural gas per cremation, say six cremations a day, 1500 cremations a year, a gas cremator creates about 96,000 CO2 for gas and electricity in total because you have your filtration system, you have your controls, you have your fans running, so also you have electricity. For the DFW electric, the yearly energy consumption will be below 105,000 kilowatt hours per year when you operate six cremations a day, 1,500 cremations a year. When you use the above factor of 0 0.25 kilogram CO2 per kilowatt hour, mm. this gives a CO2 footprint of about 26,000 kilograms CO2. Next slide, please. 
Here you see an overview compared, compared to the amount of cremations. And if you go to the six again, you see the figures I named before. Let's say you go to two cremations a day, 500 cremations a, a year, it's a very low figure. Then you see the CO2 production of the DFW electric, around 39,000 kilograms CO2, or a DFW 6,000, we compare it to our own gas cremator, uh, around 78,000 kilograms CO2. And next to it, you see the kilogram CO2 per cremation. And there you see at the end, you already have a CO2 reduction of 49%. And the more cremations you do, you see the reduction will be bigger. Next slide, please. Fifty percent NOx reduction compared to gas or oil heated cremates. As I said before, no burners, no NOx created by burners. There is a fifty percent NOx reduction in grams per hour. The amount of NOx per cubic meters that's about the same in both types of cremates. You have still the process and the body and the coffin, but due to the lack of gas burners and the more gentle process. The average volume rate in an electric cremator is half the amount of that in a gas cremator. So the average volume rate in an electric cremator is about 1100 cubic meters, and the average volume rate in the gas cremator is about 2200 cubic meters. The process temperature is still above 800 degrees Celsius, and I will explain it later on. So the denox is still possible, but the question must be. Do we need it due to the low NOx production? Because be aware, also urea injection gives a CO2 addition. So you save some NOx, but you create CO2. Next slide, please. Long lasting heat resistant brickwork. Brickwork in a cremator lasts longer in a cremator, which keeps its temperature. It's the same as in a gas cremator. So the thermal shocks are lower. And in, in an electric cremator, it's kept on temperature 24 7, 365 days a year, which you have less thermal shocks. We use silicium carbide tiles. It's a very hard material. It gives a good through flow of heat in the cremator. It acts a little bit like glass. So the elements are behind it. It is the same with the sun. You feel the sun coming from the, through the glass. And it is the same with silicium carbide. It's a very hard material. The electrical elements are placed from the outside in the construction for easy maintenance and the exchange of brickwork or elements. The maintenance cost savings are at least 10%, and it has to do with the long lasting brickwork, but also a lack of moisture in the system. Low energy consumption. The electric cremate is kept on temperature, as I said before, 24 7, 365 days a year. And you have to imagine it is like a battery which stores thermal energy. So not electricity, no, you build up with electricity the heat in the cremator, or you build it up with the cremation processes. The body and the coffin are the fuel for the cremation process. Here's some examples. A male of 75 kilograms in a wooden coffin gives about 220 kilowatt hours of energy. And a female gives about 267 kilowatt hours of energy. In a gas cremator, it is sufficient to cremate contiguously. So that means if you have only one or two cremations a day, you can better save them for the next day and do them more in a, in a row. In an electric cremator, every process you put in gives more energy than it costs. So it will heat up the cremator. Due to the energy efficient process, the average cremation time of the DFW electric is about 30 minutes longer than in a gas cremator. It's the same with your washing machine. If you have an economical program, it takes a little bit more time. Next slide, please. Here we have the, the yearly energy consumption and costs. We have the, with six cremations a day, the example what I gave before, then you see 105,000 kilowatt hours in an electric cremator and you see 518,000 kilowatt hours for gas and electricity. I used the prices uh, for uh, the, the electricity prices and the gas prices used in the UK. You have a feeling about cost savings then. 
And you see that at three cremations a day, there is a break even point in costs. But with every cremation, you see a lower energy uh, usage. And you see that energy reduction totally to the right. So that gives you a feeling about how low in energy the total cremator is. And these figures are not only for the cremator, but for the complete system, including filtration system. Next slide, please. Extraction heat energy uses of the cremation process. Because the gas volume rate is 50% lower than in gas cremator, also the energy extraction from the flue glasses is lower because we don't destroy as much energy in an electric cremator as we do in a gas cremator. The estimated available energy is around 125 kilo, kilowatt hours per cremation process. But we are practical guys and we want to have practical figures and that is why we built it in in our latest installation. So our second half of 2021, we have practical figures of that reuse of energy of the heat of the flue gas. Next slide, please. The emissions meets the PC5 emission demands. Extensive emission tests were performed in North Oxfordshire and Galen, and we both passed the PC5 demands. An abated gas cremator needs to work with an afterburner chamber temperature of a minimum of 800 degrees Celsius because the air volume in the chamber is heated and not the brickwork. An electric cremator can work with a minimum afterburner chamber temperature of 700 degrees Celsius because the total construction is 700 degrees Celsius. But as I said earlier, when the process starts, that the coffin is charged, then immediately the temperatures will rise up to above 800 degrees Celsius. That starts within a few minutes. And that is also uh, in the process where you create a little bit of NOx. So denox is still possible. Next slide, please. Here, I will explain a little bit about the heat radiation inside the cremator. To do the left, we see the DFW electric, and the elements are in the brickwork, and you see the heat radiation coming from the brickwork, and you see the colder spot in the electric cremator that's in the same part of the chambers of the cremator when it is in rest. With the gas cremator to the right, you see the flame, heat radiation coming to the flame, and you see the hotter spot in the cremators in the center near the flame. So it gives a little bit of a feeling about the heat radiation in the gas cremator and an electric cremator. Next slide, please. Difficult cremations. Cancer tissue costs more energy to cremate. We have that in our gas cremators. We also have that in our electric cremators. But the trick with the electric cremator is that we create enough energy in the primary chamber because the floor uh, is so well heated with the huge flame underneath it, which we create with the flue casters coming from the cremation process, that it rises up immediately to a minimum of 900 degrees and even hotter. And due to this high temperature, cancer tissue has less impact on the cremation time in an electric cremator. Next slide, please. Cooling down, heating up. The DFW electric is always kept on temperature, as I said before. The ready for cremation after commissioning is about 65 hours. So it takes a lot of time to heat it up from room temperature to operating temperature. That has to do with we have an electrical power, available power of the elements is 66 kilowatts. And compared to a gas cremator, you have about 650 kilowatts. That's almost 10 times more. After 3,000 cremations, we have the first cool down to 25 degrees for cleaning and inspection. And the cremator will be out of operation for about two days. And as I said earlier, the floor is so enormously hot that even the ashes can melt to the floor. And that needs an extra floor raking in the cremator. So each 600 cremations, we cool it down, not to room temperature, but we cool it down to 200 degrees. And we have a special grinding tool to clear and to, to clean the floor and get it ready for cremation again. Next slide, please. We are almost at the end of our presentation of the DFW Electric. 
This is our cremator in the center part of the Netherlands. It's a single end cremator. And this year, the first double end electric cremators are going to operate in Germany and also in the Netherlands. This is my end of the, the presentation, Scott. So over to you again, Scott. Thanks, Dennis. Uh, our next panelist is Simon Holden from the Faunus Group. Uh, Simon's going to give us uh, some more interesting information. Simon, over to you. Uh, thanks, Scott. Uh, good morning. As Scott said, my name's Simon. I'm from the Faunus Group. And I'm here to talk about the work that we do with VPI, uh, Verde Products Inc. in uh, the States and the work we do together, which is dedicated to naturally reducing the negative impact on soil and land health by current dispersal methods, uh, which are burial and ash dispersal. <clears throat> I'm about to try and squeeze 12 years of PhD level research into 10 minutes, so please do bear with me. Uh, next slide, please, Scott. Okay, so polishing coal. And there are three areas of cremation that will always be of environmental or operational concern. Uh, the emissions, uh, not just the CO2, the nitrates, the mercury escape, the particulates, the air particulates. If you any, any combustion, you can't avoid, avoid these, these emissions. Um, energy usage, uh, pressure on the grid, I'm sorry, Dennis, but uh, pressure on the grid, the automotive industry needs to be all electric by 2035. Hickley Point, the next power station due online, isn't due until 26, 2026. Uh, that got signed off in 2010. You can see there's a, a big lag in these things uh, being, being authorised and coming online. Um, so plug it in. Uh, seems to be answer for everything and it, it really can't be the grid won't be able to cope and then the third issue is the the ashes that are created at the end of it uh, 1100 tons of harmful cremated ashes created each year um, that need to be dispersed unregulated within the, the uk um, ashes with a ph of 11.8 saline limits of between 200 and 2000 times the tolerance of any plant native to the uk and um, obviously nasty stuff and that's enough ashes to negatively affect a piece of land about the size of 385 football pitches in the UK every single year. Um, and as you can imagine, any new business um, proposing this um, would obviously be shut down straight away. And it's just one of those things that's always just slipped through the net as part of the cremation process. Um, next slide, please, Scott. So start from scratch, uh, radical problems um, need radical thinking. Um, and if we were going to start from scratch and we're going to look at a process of dispersal, what would that process look like? It would have a, a carbon negative process. It would eliminate all air particulates. It would eliminate mercury escape and maybe not just eliminate the mercury escape, but you'd be able to capture, store, uh, responsibly, uh, you know, get rid of or indeed to, uh, uh, to recycle. The uh, minimal energy usage, it'd be nice if you didn't just have minimal energy usage but you're actually completely self-sufficient and fed a little bit back into the grid that'd be lovely um and a full cycle process so there's no there's no secondary negative output from the process there's not that extra issue to deal with at the end of it um <clears throat> accepted by all uh, by public conscious so and it's not just the process it needs to be the price point and and the price point it's not just affordable for, for the bereaved but also for the owners the operators the people that uh, will be you know, implementing the system, um, a system that pays for itself after nine years, not so clever, um, a system that start, starts showing profit at the end of year two, beginning of year three, uh, you know, much, much better. So radical problems, radical solutions. Uh, slide number four, please, Scott. So this is our this is our dream team. This is the forensic team that we work with. Um, it's an impressive uh, group. We nickname them the Boffins. Um, I'm a little bit upset that yet again I've been missed off that missed off that list. Um, but the, these really are like the hope, the Harlem Globetrotters of the forensic science world. They are, you know, these are the top buds. And please feel free to to research these chaps afterwards. Um, slide five. I'm rattling along. Okay. Um, so Mother Nature has been doing it since since life began. Uh, natural dispersal of bodies is obviously nothing new. It's, it's been going on since life has existed on planet Earth. Um, but work began with VPI in 2009, studying, monitoring, monitoring and collecting data from burials. Um, hundreds of test burials were carried out with pigs, but let me state that they were poorly pigs to begin with, um, at differing depths, where with different calibrated mediums, we then studied and identified and isolated the relevant activators, which are the enzymes, the bacteria, the microorganisms, the fungi that are most efficient at certain depths. 
Um, many years later and much lab time later, this gave us RTN. And RTN is it's critical and it's the linchpin in everything that we do. Um, during this process, we also developed a thorough understanding of the very different stages of dispersal and decomposition. You can categorically break them down into the different sections. Um, this provided what Professor Carter and Professor Tibbet believe to be the single most comprehensive data set uh, currently available on the subject. We had to go through that process because it didn't exist. Um, and so for us to begin the research and development, we first had to develop the data set. Um, that got us thinking. Um, at the back end of that research that if we could fully disperse a bottle in a body in under three years in ground conditions in standard burial, then what could we can do if we controlled all the variables and everything else that went along with it. Um, so that's what we did as the next logical stage of our research and development with RTN. Uh, we began to delve into the environmental controls and the, and the variables that we just couldn't get a handle on or control in a standard ground burial. And that led us to the uh, next slide, please, Scott. That led us to the pod system. So pod system, precision organic dispersal. Um, and I apologize for the images there, but obviously we are research and development and uh, operation. And so our razzmatazz and showmanship probably isn't up to scratch with uh, other folks, but we can't show you the schematics because they're a little bit sensitive at the moment, but this gives you an idea of what a pod is and how a pod sensor would look. Um, next slide, please, Scott. So, Final phase of testing beginning later this year. The final phase of testing is being carried out at Reading University Forensic Sciences Department and the results, the data and all of the findings are gonna be made available for public and peer review. Um, the whole study is also gonna be documented in live streaming and webcast. We basically won't be hiding anything. There's no smoke, no mirrors, no genie behind the, the curtain. Um, we're gonna be as transparent with the process as we possibly can. Um, this will be the third phase of testing um, and the third, the third uh, issue, or if you like, of the pod, and um, the, 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 this final stage of testing is going to be carried out in the production-ready version of the pod, and the prototype of that, that's, so that's very exciting stuff. Um, the aim is to achieve full body dispersal in three months or under, uh, which we're obviously quite confident um, of being able to do, otherwise we're, I won't be talking to you guys now. Um, it's a full cycle system. Uh, the, the full cycle means there's nothing left, so there is no secondary process after the after the after you've been through the pod uh, transition. Uh, this means there's no hair, no teeth, anything keratin based, which is the, the, the problem with, with, with the, to get rid of in any any kind of burial. Um, it's all broken down into effective and accessible nutrients, uh, with all of the prohibitors removed. So any any fauna, any plant life can immediately interact uh, with with the uh, with with the byproducts. Um, the, the, the system is basically uh, operated by the supercharged activators and they're very, the very specialist mix of enzymes, bacteria, and microorganisms and fungi that I mentioned before. They're all isolated and contained and, and calibrated within the RTN. The RTN for the pod is different, slightly different, different calibration to, to our other uh, variations of the RTN. So it's a very specialist um, medium that goes into the pod that, that enables it to do what it does. Um, fully automated data controlled operation. So the pod itself, the pod monitors and adjusts the various environmental controls as the dispersal decomposition progresses, providing optimum conditions for the activators required at that stage of decomposition. So whether they be acting on the fatty acids, which are the soft tissues, which are the, the, the easiest part of the whole process, um, it's very easy to get rid of the soft tissue. Uh, the problems will come when you start dealing with the tough cartilage, cartilaginous connective tissues, the bones, the hair, the teeth, again, anything that's creatine based. Um, and the specialist activators required at each stage are managed via the data that's produced. So the pod, each pod transition is unique within um, its own tolerance. Uh, each activator gives off its own trace signal. Um, and by understanding their signature and the stage of decomposition, that they're active, we can accurately monitor and say what's happening within the pod at that time, meaning we can optimize the conditions as required um, for, for that particular stage of decomposition. And also ultimately it will tell us when that process is finished and uh, that the process is run. And so back to the scratch list. Um, um, you know, uh, carbon negative process. Yes, eliminate all air particulates. Absolutely, there's no combustion. Uh, eliminate all mercury escape, absolutely 100%. Uh, minimal energy usage, 
we, we uh, theoretically we are going to be able to self power and um, very much like uh, Dennis was saying about the self burning uh, of the cadavers, we, we will be able to harness certain energy sources coming from that and hopefully we'll be able to not only power ourselves, but we'll be able to feed back a little bit into the grid as well to help with all of those cars that we've got to plug in from 2035. Um, accept a full cycle process, absolutely, and accepted by the public conscious. Um, that's, <laughs> we believe that that is obviously something that the public are ready for and for our work with one of our other companies, Woodland Burial Companies. Um, so next slide, please. So what happens after? The, one second. The, the, the system is effectively, follows the same course as cremation in the eyes of the bereaved. Um, so it won't be any great leap of, 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 of understanding for, for the uh, end user. Services can be held anywhere permissible, you know, existing chapels, church halls, private venues, Anywhere we can hold a service, you can hold a service for, for this. When the curtain goes down, that's when obviously the cadaver then moves to the pod centre rather than to cremation. For the, for, the, for, the, for the bereaved, it's the same bereavement cycle. Um, the family still receive back uh, pretty much the same weight as an ashes of, of products in order to then have a memorial with afterwards. Um, regardless of where you use that memorial though, or where you use the, 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 the returned, um, tree planting scattered and turned it's a positive impact so that there isn't there's that break from the ashes um, and as we've witnessed with the woodland burial company um, and the growth and growth each year the public's appetite for envir environmentally minded and managed memorial parks and cemeteries is growing dramatically year on year um, we're certainly noticing a, a huge increase on that um, and slide nine please so the cherry on top the system byproducts is an environmental plus. Um, so there is only a positive with the byproducts. Uh, the capacity to kick, kick start repair poor soil conditions. Again, the, the, the byproducts of, of the process is used in a positive way in, in, in positive places. Uh, can be used in tree planting, habitat creation or soil repair. Absolutely. Um, and accelerated growth in CO2 sequestration. Now that, that last bit, I needed clarification from myself. Um, at least twice from the boffins. And it, it sounds too good to be true, um, but in fact, there are preliminary growth studies. The results show that plants, trees, or even new meadows um, grown from the, 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 the system byproduct grow quicker, a, a lot quicker. And initial predictions lend towards uh, an additional 20% in CO2 sequestration from any tree planted in the byproducts. Um, now it's early days with, with, the, with the growth studies, because obviously growth studies take a long time, um, but looking, it's looking very promising. And to put that into numbers, when we're talking about planting a million trees a year, you all of a sudden got the equivalent of planting 1.2 million trees a year. So that is a huge, 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 uh, you know, uh, cherry on top of the whole system. Um, it's obviously been very difficult to fit this into the the 10 minute allocated slot, and I hope I've managed to do that. Um, I have skipped past obviously huge swathes of information um, in order to, to get to that point. But um, yeah, um, thanks for listening. And if you've got any questions, please don't hesitate to get in contact and I'd be more than happy to talk to anyone in more detail about the work that we're doing. Thanks a lot. Thanks, Simon. Uh, our final panelist for today is Hannah Leverton representing SAFE to talk about changes that are happening with some funeral directors to deliver eco-friendly funeral arrangements. Over to you, Hannah. Thank you, Scott. Hi, everybody. I'm Hannah Leverton from Leverton & Sons. We're an independent funeral director in North London with six branches and have been operating since 1789. We conduct about um, a thousand funerals or over a thousand funerals, adult funerals, sorry, a year, and I provide the communications for the company. Uh, I hope that what I have to say is useful today, but if you have any questions and something I can't answer at the end, um, I will ask my colleagues. We're members of many organisations and are founding members of SAFE, the Association for Independent Funeral Directors. We're part of the Environmental Stewardship Group and have been Associated Green Funeral Directors for many years. The greening of funerals has been on our own agenda for a very long time now, so much so that we pioneered the UK's first all-electric hearse with Brahms, which you can see being used today across the country. So we have a green agenda and ethos at Leverton's, which we try to weave into the choices we offer to our clients. But this is not necessarily the case across the profession. Some funeral directors we find, in fact, only exist to offer green funeral options and others don't really focus on it at all. 
However, should it also come down to uh, being a consumer led rather than funeral director driven or a mixture of both? Next slide, please. Thank you. As we are a profession, sorry, are we as a profession consumer led? For example, supermarket consumers used to use a huge amount of single plastic carrier bags for their shopping. Only once the government legislated the commercial companies selling the products to introduce the fee in 2015, did we see a huge change in single use plastic bags being used. So much so, the official figures showed a 95% decrease in use of plastic bags since the 5p, which is going to go to 10p, fee was introduced in 2015. So do our clients come to us with a green agenda when it comes to funerals? Just like with the bag before the fee was introduced, many of us would acknowledge and were, are aware that we have a climate emergency, and yet we still often make funeral arrangement choices without that being a core value. We would say in our experience currently, only 5% of our clients come to us with an explicit request for a greener funeral. Clients' choices are often based on traditional values and what they deem as normal and sadly in the funeral world, that has often meant high energy consumption options and those with detrimental effects on the environment. In our experience so far, it's simply not on the agenda of the consumer yet. There are also the emotional sensitivities we have to take into account. We are a consumer-led organisation who are often referred to as offering everything to everyone. It is our job to be able to listen carefully to the wishes of our client and then offer them the funeral that they want. We often find clients aren't aware of the greener funeral options or it's something that they simply haven't even thought about. And when they come to us, of course, they are suffering grief and learning more and more and more options can often become information overload. So it's always our job to weave the green options and tailor choices to suit the client's wishes but only if we have enough information and the right options available to us. Funeral directors can, off, can offer green funeral options, such as electric hearses to cut carbon emissions and woodland or natural burial sites. It should be clarified here that I am using the term natural burial ground rather than woodland burial ground, as some burial grounds are existing woodland, where burials lie between the trees, whereas other burial grounds start as fields, where trees are planted once the burial has taken place. Um, at, to form a new future woodland. Some burial grounds will not even contain trees, but will instead become meadows and natural flowers. The land and the natural species that use these um, can be preserved and turned into nature reserves or country parks. Biodegradability allows for the grave spaces to be reused. However, natural burial grounds are not for everyone as traditional methods, uh, sorry, traditional memorials are not allowed currently. As an inner city funeral director in London, we find that we, they can be some distance away, only reachable by car from urban areas. For example, for us, we have no dedicated natural burial ground within the M25, which circles around London, for those of you who don't know where we are. Some urban cemeteries have, have started natural burial sections to use parts of the cemetery unusable for traditional graves, i.e. wooded areas. But these areas are generally small and restricted at the moment. The emergence of electric vehicles is certainly a key way forward, particularly for urban funerals. There are continuing improvements in the technology and battery capacity, but there needs to be electric points at crematoriums and cemeteries. Currently, there are none at any of our local ones that we use regularly. Over the last 150 years, the distance traveled on funerals has increased due to the development of the internal combustion engine. Local graveyards are now rarely used and there has been a rise of private and local authority cemeteries covering the wider local area. In many rural areas of the country, the local crematorium is still some distance away. Hearses and limousines by their very nature tend to be heavy users of petrol or diesel and mourners do not use public transport, often driving themselves in their own private cars at the moment. The impact of families repeatedly returning to the graveside for reflection and solace should also be factored in. Most people know about natural coffins made of natural materials such as willow or bamboo. They are biodegradable and involve no glue. They're, they are cheaper than solid wood and individually made, and they seem more sustainable and eco-friendly, but often are imported from Eastern Europe or China or in the Far East in large container ships. And we find that willow, English willow is more expensive. The people that come to us often um, choose them for their aesthetics rather than being more environmentally friendly. That's usually the reason of, ch the, the reason of choice. 
Apart from the coffin itself, we should also be looking to use environmentally friendly options for all the fittings, the caps, the handles, the linings, etc. It would be good to have some way for us to compare the relative greenness of coffins. Is cardboard as good as it sounds? Does it use as much energy as in manufacturing as the wood? Can coffins shipped from Poland or China be greener than those in the UK, made in the UK, sorry. It's these bigger questions in terms of what is in fact more energy efficient that we often as funeral directors find really challenging to answer or resolve. It would be helpful to have an easy way of showing this, e.g. a numerical scale, i.e. The, the higher the number, the greener it is, like a traffic-like system or an alphabetical scale like we find with electrical appliances. Environmental sustainability will be the key in all of this. Another example to give you is the webcasting of funerals. Since COVID, this format has become the norm and will continue to be normal, even when restrictions are lifted. In the past, we found filming funerals was often seen as odd by a lot of clients. This is a consumer-led example. The impact means less people are traveling to a funeral and subsequent carbon emissions are reduced. However, to begin with, people may make a point of attending funerals in person and delay the funeral until restrictions are fully lifted after the pandemic. In fact, the physical attendance at a funeral is really worth noting here. It's more than just witnessing the service, which you can do by watching the webcast. It's also really about gathering with other people in person to provide support and solace in their shared grief. Technology can only go so far, but it can't always replace the value of the funeral's purpose. Digitization really is important, however, and it's really important in our company operations and systems in our own offices. We've worked really hard to be less paper led. The profession traditionally has an over-reliance on heavy paper usage. Working practices can always be reviewed and developed to include energy saving initiatives. We've been working at this for a long time now and have invested in systems from CRM systems to, reduce, to reducing paper storage and shredding, even shredding paper to use in our pillows. Arrangements are done by phone and email at the moment, making them paperless involving no traveling but we don't see our clients until the day of the funeral. We lose that human touch we've just talked about. Often the client given the choice would still travel to see the funeral director to make the arrangement. Personal, count, sorry, personal contact counts for a lot in our line of work. So we all agree it's time to move the sustainability of funerals forwards, but what are the challenges to overcome? Consumer-led behaviour change, we think, will be key as long as we present openly the green options and benefits, some of which we've heard earlier from Simon and Dennis. What has been deemed as traditional needs to be reframed and normalised. It's all in the telling of the options, the weaving of the green agenda, which is much easier when we can physically meet with people and read their actual interest. The infrastructure and options have to be there again, like we heard earlier, along with costs being less prohibitive, for example, like for like electric hearses, which ultimately relies on technology improving. To have an impact, there must also be a way to reach all funeral directors so that we can all be consistent and standardised in our policy and our options to do what, to do that, that what we require, sorry, to do that what we require as a responsible organisation to take this forward. And we will need that organisation to make this happen and to make the impact we need quickly enough it will need to be brought about through legislation we think. Like with the shopping bag example to make the consumer options greener to make the options we offer to clients greener and more measurable. SAFE our membership body with over 2,000 independent funeral directors across the UK have identified the need for a profession-wide initiative. They are committed to the environmental journey using a pragmatic approach. In 2019, they put forward a paper, the Carbon Neutral Initiative, which identifies trade bodies as having a potential influential role to play in this movement for change. They confirm in this paper much of what we as one funeral director has experienced is represent representative of the profession. To start, it identifies ways to take all of this forward, including a combined and collaborative trade body effort to approach the government for policy and support. It suggests consultations with their members to identify doable timescales and really subs and then subsequent goal setting and sign up. 
they are also focusing their next education sorry their next educational day on the 10th of november featuring an environmental expert this initiative is a starting point and we must now pull together to move forwards and quickly thank you very much i hope this was um, of some use and I really appreciate being invited today thank you Thanks, Hannah. You're welcome. Um, so uh, now we're into uh, the Q&A session, uh, really just to kind of wrap up. I can see the panel have been very busy answering lots of questions as we go, um, but we have a few here. Um, I have a question for Simon. Uh, really interesting presentation, thank you. Where would the pod centres be and where would, be, where would the deceased be taken? Does the process exclude traditional coffins? Helps if you're on mute before I start saying that. <laughs> um, the, um, so uh, the, the pod centres can be wherever. Um, we, we've talked to a few local authorities, how local authorities have their own uh, crematoria, how um, uh, uh, private operators have their own crematoria, exactly the same premise really, they, they can be wherever, there's there's no uh, geographical uh, demand on where they can be built. And as for the traditional coffin, that was one of the points that's not in, uh, we, we didn't have time to talk about, you, you, you wouldn't really necessarily need a bespoke coffin for it, um, with you could have a show coffin, if you will, um, much like the hearse is reused time and time again, um, with a little bit of, uh, you know, changing, changing thought process that we, we could also cut out thousands of coffins of production and shipping um, and everything else that goes with them out of the market as well. So uh, the, the cof that we, we envisage the coffin becoming a bit like a hearse, it'd be a show, it'd be a show um, piece rather than an actual practical piece that, that lowers into the ground and and does that so in effect you would you would basically have a show coffin that would be reused perfect okay um you've generated quite quite a, a flurry of questions simon so um we always do <laughs> uh, the next one was if there are two thousand funerals taking three months to decompose does this require 500 pods i'm not sure who's doing the maths but um, so basically, it, it, it's about the turnaround per pod. So it's, it's three months per transition, there or thereabouts. Um, you get four transitions per pod. So a 1,200 pod, uh, a 300 pod centre would do um, uh, your 1,200 and the mass, mass thereafter. Um, I say we're hoping, um, three months we're banding about, but we're hoping that we're going to be able to nibble off of that and squeeze five, maybe six out per year, per pod. Perfect. And the, and the, the next question for you, which is um, an interesting one, uh, what would the ballpark figure cost for each pod? A thousand or ten thousand? For each pod, as in, is that the cost of per transition via the pod, or is that the cost of purchasing the pod as a piece yes, of technology? Cost of purchase. Looking at that, so the cost of purchase per pod uh, would be around seventeen and a half to eighteen thousand um, pounds, and the price point is between cremation and burial. Average burial four and a half grand, cremation. Um, I, I don't know what the actual figures are, but I think they're about 2,800 or something like that. And so the price point will be between there. So you'd be looking at about £4,200, but obviously you don't have the cost of a casket for the end user on that either. Okay. Um, so, as I say, uh, the panel have been answering lots of questions. And so the, the ones that they have uh, responded to during the Q&A in, in, in text, Will be added in terms of the website and the webinar afterwards and, and shared. Um, if there are uh, any, I think that's I think that's about all the questions we have for today. Um, and so with that, I will wrap up and move forward. So um, Thank you for joining us for today's event. I hope that you found this session beneficial. Please take a look at the Open Centre website blog section. You'll find several informative articles which relate to not just today's topic, but several others. We are running a series of events over the coming months. So again, please take a look and register. The next in the series uh, that we've got scheduled, you can see here. 
And as I said at the beginning, we will be distributing recordings of today's event in the coming days, and please feel free to share those links with your colleagues. If you have any other ideas or thoughts in terms of topics that you would like us to cover or explore, uh, we are more than interested to hear from you. So once again, thank you all for your time today um, and uh, have a good day. <laughs>